With the blare of the brass band and beat of a drum, you're transported to Oaxaca, Mexico. <laughs> the rhythms binding generations together through time. The storytellers, dancers, sharing their heritage and customs through movement and vibrant costumes. The traditions passed down and kept alive by Latinos who keep a piece of home while they grow new roots in the United States. I'm from Santo Domingo, Tonalá, Oaxaca. Yo soy Santiago Gustavo, Oaxaca. Yo vengo de Pátzcuaro, Michoacán. Ustedes, muchísimas gracias por venir a Oaxaca, en Sacramento. Vidal Beltrán Aguilera is a dance teacher on a mission to preserve and share his culture in Sacramento. Aunque vivamos aquí en, en Estados Unidos, no debemos olvidar de dónde venimos. In 2010, he started a dance group called La Custre Michoacán de Ocampo, dedicated to carrying on traditional Mexican dances and celebrations. It brings together immigrants and locals looking for connection to their heritage. Something Vidal found was missing when he came to the United States from Michoacán, Mexico, nearly 20 years ago. Muchas de las personas dejamos lo que es nuestra familia, dejamos lo que es nuestra niñez dentro de, de México. Entonces, lo que yo trato de hacer aquí en Estados Unidos es traer un poquito de lo que nosotros dejamos allá. He started dancing at a young age, making costumes for dance competitions with help from his mother. Mi mamá fue una de las que nos ayudó a coser Día y noche, hacer los vestuarios. Costumes that represent Mexico's history. The country has one of the most diverse indigenous populations in Latin America. Oaxaca's native indigenous population makes up more than 30% of the state. Numerous ethnic groups from Mixtec to Zapotec carrying on their own unique traditions, showcased through dances still practiced today. Vidal and other Northern California dance groups purchase authentic dresses, jewelry, and costume pieces from Oaxaca to show respect to their culture. One Mexican dance style known for its costumes, La Danza de los Diablos, or Dance of the Devils. Everybody has their own mask, their own style of what they depict what the devil looks like. The masks made of wood adorned with animal horns. Dancers also wear chivaras, which are chaps made of leather and goat hair. I mean, we use the traditional chicote, which is the devil wood. The crack of the chicote, an iconic part of the Dance of the Devils. Los Diablos de Santiago Juslahuaca, based in Napa, California, carrying on the traditional dance style from the Mixteca region of Oaxaca. Esta danza es para todos. Y es algo, me siento muy orgullosa porque lo que hacemos es algo que hacemos con, mucho, con mucha pasión, eh, representando siempre lo que somos. Somos oaxaqueños, somos mexicanos. In Mexico, Oaxacans come together each summer for a festival called La Guelaguetza, also known as Los Lunes del Cero, or Mondays on the Hill. The indigenous tradition is about sharing cultures through unique dances and customs from each of the eight regions of Oaxaca. The festival originally had religious roots honoring the Aztec god of corn, but it has evolved over the years to symbolize reciprocity and strengthen the bond between Oaxaca's diverse regions, including the Central Valley. Estoy ahorita portando es de los Valles Centrales y representa a las chinas oaxaqueñas. Folk dancers representing las chinas oaxaqueñas dance in vibrant skirts while balancing a basket on their heads. Alicia Martinez with Napa Valley-based dance group Valle Folclorico Valle de Santa Elena says the dance represents the work of women in the community. Originally from Oaxaca, sharing these traditional dances is something close to her heart. When I came here, I have a dream to make my group teach my kids, teach my people how it feels being part of Oaxaca culture and roots.
Whether born in Oaxaca or in the United States, these traditional dances connect people across space and time. Yo enseño lo que a mí me enseñaron mis an mis antepasados, mis tíos, o lo que a mí me enseñaron en mi pueblo. Northern California dance groups guiding even the youngest of dancers, the next wave of creative leaders who will continue to preserve these traditions. We have family there and we, it just connects us there, so we want to keep the roots going to our future generations. Hi, I'm Crisia Regalado. I am a Salvadoran American and my artistic name is Sin Color. I grew up in a Salvadoran household and it was very lively, very happy environment filled with music, cumbias, parties, and of course, karaoke nights. I remember when my dad brought a microphone home, I immediately grabbed it and was like jumping on the couch and using it as my stage and just singing along to all the songs they were singing. I love cumbias, um, and you can definitely see that approach in my vocal technique and my vocal colors and in the instrumentals. Cumbia was originally made in Colombia, but it has spread throughout um, Central America. The reason why we have adopted it as our own music is because it's really hard to find what our organic sound is. A long time ago, we were conquered, and all of our roots have been like um, kind of lost. The Hispanic Heritage Month to me means embracing the diversity found in our cultures, embracing our Spanish language, and um, learning to treat everyone with equality and dignity and respect. My name is Francisco Castillo and I am Nicaraguan. I moved to uh, San Francisco, California uh, back in 1985. So my, my family fled uh, Nicaragua uh, in the 80s, early 80s, uh, because of the Sandinista Revolutionary War that was going on. The family that brings us together is, is key in, in my culture, uh, in the Latino culture. And so uh, growing up, uh, you know, it, the traditions were uh, we got together almost every holiday for Christmas. Um, I remember getting together at my uh, grandparents' homes and the dish that we eat every Christmas uh, was nacatamales, which is a traditional uh, Nicaraguan um, dish. On October 11th of 2020, uh, during the pandemic, uh, I came out as a gay Latino man. And that was challenging for me because in the Latino culture, you know, family values are important. Uh, and I was afraid of rejection. I was afraid of being isolated. What I realized was that I was actually embraced uh, by my community. Nicaragua is, is the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, and so there's a lot of misconceptions with many Latin American countries in general. And one of them is, you know, obviously, uh, Nicaragua is not safe. Uh, many regions in the country, uh, may, you know, that may be the case, but it's a beautiful country for tourist attraction. Uh, there's a lot of rich culture, cultural heritage that, um, that still obviously exists within the country. You know, I feel like I am home. Stage, and I will say always, stage is my home. It's where I feel the most comfortable, when I feel loved, when I feel the love for everything and everybody around, I feel like home. Mariachi music dates back to the early 1800s, and back then, women listened, men performed. In Mexico, we have this culture of is the male who brings the serenades to the ladies, is the man who is the provider. But uh, times have changed. And back then, only men wore the colorful charro or the Mexican bow tie, and only men chatted the party starting grito. <laughs> This is Mariachi Bonitas, Sacramento's all-female mariachi band, founded by singer-songwriter Donora Klingler. My field started being in pop and rock and roll and all that stuff when I was, I was around 14 is when I started. 
Denora's life is devoted to music. She can sing in five languages, and she can perform in just about every musical genre, from the flamenco to jazz, and funk to cumbia. But it wasn't until she left her home in Mexico City that the sounds of the guitarron, the violin, and the trumpet led her down a path of female mariachi. I formed an all-female mariachi band in 1997 in Los Angeles, California, called Las Salondras. As you can imagine, gaining respect in a centuries-old male-dominated music genre wasn't easy, especially when she tried to incorporate herself in other male bands. I went to, to try to, to put myself into a mariachi band, and the guy, the, the mariachi owner, told me, uh, I don't hire women. As a musician, Donora would form or join many bands and move across the country over the years. That experience taught her that to make it in mariachi, she had to be both an entertainer and a businesswoman. So in 2014, she started the Mariachi Festival in Sacramento. This year is nine years. Uh -huh. I've been producing this show, and I bring mariachis from all over the place, over the world, but I didn't have my own. I just produce it, I sing with them, but then, you know, the pandemic came. When the pandemic halted music events, Donora went back to her roots. She formed a mariachi band with her close friends and played in her neighborhood. That band became Mariachi Bonitas, and they quickly made a name for themselves. And give it up for Dinora, Janessa, Audra, Jordan, and Samantha Mariachi Bonitas. In 2021, the band was invited to the Kelly Clarkson Show, which elevated their music careers and inspired them to move forward. She said to me, I'll see you at the Grammys. And that was very inspiring. That's, that's what uh, it took for me to record our first album. For over a century, men dominated mariachi. Denora says she was never out to change the way that mariachi was played or performed. All she wanted was a spot on the stage for her and her bonitas. With Grammy or not, we're gonna keep doing it because it's important for us to share what we have and it's a lot of mariachi bonitas for a long time. Reporting for Hispanic Heritage Month, I'm John Bartel. Aninsu Matuhu Marialena. Hello, good day, my name is Marialena. Uh, I am descended from Kashkan and Otomi people of central Mexico, Aguascalientes for Kashkan, and southern Mexico, Telexcala, Mex uh, Telexcala Mexico for the Otomi side. Um, the language I just greeted you in is Nyanyu, uh, also known as Otomi. When my, uh, my great grandparents came up from Mexico, they had to learn Spanish, they weren't allowed to use their own language and that when my own grandparents were born here and raised in California, they uh, were not allowed to speak Spanish at school. So it was really important for my dad to make sure that I spoke Spanish. However, growing up, I was excluded from a lot of Latino communities that includes the Chicano community um, here in the United States. And then even just in organizing as an indigenous woman, I find myself sometimes excluded um, in native communities because of my my descendancy comes from across the border. We're all from this land. I can trace back my ancestors to the two continents that are connected, um, but I'm still told that I am less than when I show up in some spaces. During this month, as we celebrate Latino identity, whatever that means to you, to just remember to be expansive in that identity because it might look one way to you, but that doesn't mean that the minority is not part of your majority. Hello, my name is Sara Burga. I am the executive director of the Brazilian Center for Cultural Exchange of Sacramento. I'm from Brazil, I, uh, from Manaus, Amazon. My father was a Yanomami Indian, and uh, my mother's uh, from uh, Portugal. My grandparents are from Nigeria and Portuguese. So I grew up in an environment where uh, culture and uh, the diversity of uh, different country was, uh, was a key. But when we go out in the street because of the texture of our hair, because my parents was from Africa and from uh, Portugal and uh, also an Indian from Amazon, that create 
uh, a problem in bullying in school and such. So it was a little bit difficult for me as growing up outside of my household. However, inside was always a party. So I always been very interested in dance, something they call Bumba Meu Boy. We bring this to the, the streets of uh, Manaus and we compete for the, for the best group. That was my first experience and uh, it's, it was extremely important to, uh, for me to continue performing um, to this day, of course. As the lunch crowd rolls into La Paria Mexican restaurant in Modesto, a familiar smell is making its way out of Chef Margarita's kitchen. Nopales, also known as cactus, is the main ingredient in the two dishes she's cooking up as part of an old family recipe that was passed down from generation to generation. Desde mi abuela, mi madre. Nopales is a staple in most Hispanic households. It's flavorful, relatively inexpensive, and healthy for you. The only problem, it's hard to find in most U.S. grocery stores. But a farming family in Oakdale is working to change that. We're striving to educate people about nopales and so that they're able to try it and just give it a chance. This is Products from Paradise, a cactus farm trying to make fresh nopales more accessible. Yeah, right now, there's not that many places that have it. And if they do have it, it's, it's beaten up. It's, al it's, it's almost rotten. The Ruiz family farms one of the largest edible cactus farms in California, an agriculture venture that took a long time to grow. Because it's not easy. <laughs> I, I, uh, I've been here for eight years, and sometimes it's hard. Everything you see on this eight acre plot of land is planted, picked, marketed, and sold by Salvador Ruiz, his wife, and his three children. But the family's farming roots go way back. All my family in agriculture. So I, I go to the school in Mexico, but all the time I have the idea. An idea to build a pesticide-free organic farm. But unfortunately, Salvador had some difficulty profiting off traditional California crops in the beginning. But eventually, he found success in growing Nepales. You can just bite right into it? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> It's got, it's, it's like a, it's a little sour, but it's also, hmm, it's, huh. Nopales is harvested from the prickly pear cactus, which is considered both a fruit and a vegetable, so it has some complex flavors. The paddle-shaped branches, or the nopal, is considered a vegetable, and the red-colored pear, or the tuna, is the fruit. Nopales can be eaten raw, but like most vegetables, they taste better cooked. So nopales actually culturally it's very important to Mexicans. I don't know if you noticed, but it's in the Mexican flag. It's also under the feet of Our Lady of Guadalupe. The Nopales has been cultivated for food for over 9,000 years. The Aztecs used Nepal for food and medicine. And sailors also used Nepal to prevent scurvy, which helped spread the spineless prickly pear around the world. Nopales is also considered the life-giving plant because it never seems to die. You see, if the plant falls on the ground or if it's ripped off, it can form a new one. Nopal is considered a resilient plant, so that's why it represents the resilience of the Mexican people, and that's why it was also chosen to be a part of the Mexican flag. The prickly pear grows in many hot, arid parts of the United States. It's a drought-tolerant plant, but few farmers north of the border know how to grow or process Nepales on a large scale. Before you can eat Nepales, all those thorns must be removed by hand. The person that they do every day, this one, uh -huh. they can clean one box of that one in 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to take me a little while to get there. I'm not yeah. that fast. Yeah. Marketing and scaling up the operation is a challenge for the Ruiz family, but they're overcoming it. They've received grants to expand the refrigeration in their fruit stand, and they're working with local food banks and restaurants to get Nopales based meals on more dinner plates. We always get compliments because people are always like, wow, it's so hard to have a family business, how do you guys do it? And really it's that, it's love and communication, we have that. 
Nopalis is a versatile plant. It can be used in flavored drinks, beauty products, and even the pesky beetles that eat the cactus can be used to make clothing dye. And it's this versatility that gives the Ruiz family hope for expansion in the future. Once we're able to have more production, we'd be able to supply more restaurants and hopefully more people. And that's really the goal of, of our business is to supply as many people as possible with this healthy alternative and this vegan option. From the Nopalis Fields in Oakdale, I'm John Bartell. Soy Ramiro Alarcón, originario de la Ciudad de México y soy un chef mexicano. Soy el mayor de ocho hermanos, eso me permitía o de alguna manera me obligaba a que yo tenía que ayudar a los quehaceres de la casa. Es por ese motivo que ahí es donde empezó mi historia, donde mi mamá me pedía que le ayudara con las actividades de la casa y una de ellas era hacer de comer. En cada platillo que yo realizo, en cada receta que armo, puedo darme cuenta que cada chile, cada, cada ingrediente puedo identificar y puedo trasladar la cultura de, de México. Para mí el ser mexicano significa una oportunidad más para poder representar mi país, ya que eh, vengo de un México de amor, de armonía, de libertad, de que se comparte, de arropamiento, donde las familias se reúnen para poder eh, integrarse cada día, en, en cada reunión. Eh, el amor mexicano es, es algo más allá que, de, que una plática, de una conversación, es una integración familiar. Cook. I think it's in my DNA because I grow up with the chiles, spices. Cuando hablamos de Perú, la gente piensa lo primero es en la comida y la comida está amarrado a tu cultura, a tu familia. Food. The nostalgia of it can take us back to our childhood. Celebrations center around it, history and culture built on it. Food also brought chefs Giancarlo Zapata and Marlene Chavez together. For them, cooking is a tribute to their home country, Peru. Well, I am from Peru. Uh, I am very proud of that. It's the third largest country in South America, and the food is unlike any other Latin American country. We are a multicultural country. We got a lot of fusion, Spain, Italian, Chinese, or Japanese. Giancarlo feels a sense of responsibility to teach others about his country through cooking. A passion that started at a young age. Seeing his family cook and share a meal created a connection between them. Marlene's interest in cooking started when she was young too. Both graduated from Le Cordon Bleu in Peru and met in 2009. The kitchen sharpened their skills and their love for cooking brought them together, marrying a few years later. But they knew if they wanted to make their dreams of owning a restaurant come true, they would have to leave Peru. The difference between another countries is you got more opportunities here. If you want to do something, you can do it. In 2012, they arrived in Sacramento starting over. What was the hardest part about coming to the United States? Soy hija única y es bastante difícil dejar a tus papás. The most Heart always is going to be uh, the language because you are like a child. You have to learn to walk, learn to read, learn to speak. Sacramento became a place they fell in love with and began their own family. We got two kids, Valentino and Gianleni. We feel very grateful with this country because they give you the opportunity to, to make our dreams real. In 2018, their dreams of having a restaurant hit a fork in the road. They couldn't continue working full time and open a restaurant, so they quit their jobs and started cooking out of their home. 
So this is the backyard area where you guys had all the tables and everything yes. set up, yeah. This allowed them to save money for their own restaurant. They started with just two dishes, set up seating in the backyard, cafe style. So about how many people would be here at one time in the backyard? Eight tables for six, so 48 people here. Through word of mouth, orders started to pile up. Eventually, they had to hire employees just to keep up. What were the most popular dishes that you guys would serve out here? <laughs> that was the number one. Yes. Number one, yeah. Three years later, they opened Chicha Peruvian Cafe and Kitchen. Everyone who was eating in their backyard was ready to help, offering to lay flooring, hook up the electricity, and paint. We feel very uh, grateful with, with these people because they come in no, no only for the food, you know, they come to support to us. Cuando se abre la, las puertas es un nuevo comienzo. At the corner of Sunrise Avenue and Kirby Way in Roseville sits chicha, which has two meanings. It's a popular Peruvian drink made out of purple corn and previously a derogatory term for people who migrated from small towns and villages to the capital of Peru. Pero cuando vienes de tu pueblo hacia la capital, vienes con todo. Vienes con, con tu comida, con tu cultura, con tus recuerdos, con, tus, con tu música, con tu folclore. People emigrate to the capital to work hard, make their dreams come true, while never forgetting where they come from. We live our country and we come here with our dreams, with our culture, with, with everything. Chicha is now a term that has been reclaimed. Todo va junto, va a ser yuca, mancora, lomo. Macho, anticucho, y huancaina, con biste. We make everything from the scratch. They pride themselves on using fresh ingredients, creating their own Peruvian slice of heaven for people to explore decades of heritage and culture. Y a la cultura americana, cuando prueban nuestra comida, sus facciones es como que, wow, nunca he probado uh, combinaciones como la, las nuestras. Back to the Lomo Saltado. It's a um, Peruvian and Chinese fusion here. You know, for the technique also, because we use the soy sauce in it, and also we make it very, very fast with a lot of fire. Sauteed beef tenderloin, stir fried with onions, tomatoes, and soy sauce on a bed of French fries with a scoop of heavenly white rice and an egg on top. Yes, it's... Delicious. Now to one of their most popular dishes, ceviche. So she's gonna make the ceviche mixto, shrimp, calamari, and octopus on top. It's coming with Peruvian corn, sweet potato, um, Peruvian fried corn also. Y toda esa, esa textura y esa combinación hace que para mí, mi ceviche es, es único. Pescado alamacho frito, pan-fried fish topped with shrimp, calamari, and mussels, and aji amarillo, a traditional Peruvian chili pepper sauce made in-house. Chicha has been voted one of the best restaurants in Sacramento and Placer County, a nod to their standout Peruvian dishes. But this year, they got an invite they weren't expecting. The Tower Bridge. Oh my God, I, I was very excited. I, I can't believe it. They were now chefs for one of Sacramento's elite culinary events, putting Peruvian food front and center for hundreds of people. And that day, standing on the Golden Bridge in the heart of California's capital, they had made it to their city of dreams. We are happy. The life you always dreamed of? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Si nosotros no creemos en nuestros sueños, el sueño no se hace realidad. Their restaurant, now a legacy, they hope to one day pass down to their own children, hoping they feel the same connection to culture, family, and cooking. But this is just the beginning. They hope to open up another restaurant. Me encantaría tener varios restaurantes para que la gente pueda probarnos y pueda crecer esta esta cultura. Remembering where they come from, what working hard means, and never giving up. A dream we all dream. Chicha. Hello, my name is David Cordova. I was born and raised in Oaxaca, and now I'm living here in Sacramento. You know, I grew up with my family, always celebrating, being together. Uh, so I'm really proud of my culture and being from Oaxaca. So Oaxaca is really known for their moles. There's, I believe, like seven moles, different types of moles. Mole negro, mole rojo, 
and my mom will always ask us, you know, for our birthdays, what do you want me to make you for food? And me and my brothers will always respond, you know, mole. Every time that I think about my birthdays or celebration, I always think about having mole together with my family. We have the Kelaquets as well, which is a, where the whole town gets together and just celebration uh, with the dances from the state of Oaxaca. Some of the misconceptions uh, about Oaxaca or being from Oaxaca, uh, some people uh, might think that you have to look a certain way or you gotta speak indigenous language to be from Oaxaca and that's not true. You know, Oaxaca is so diverse. You know, that I encourage everyone just to visit Oaxaca and just learn more about our culture, all traditions from Oaxaca. I try to stay connected with my culture, my traditions, by just visiting my family in Oaxaca, just learning more and just making sure that I'm, I am proud of or where I'm coming from and just learning more about my traditions. My name is uh, Maria Carbonell. I'm from La Habana, Cuba, and I'm um, the president and editor of the Primera Mano magazine. Growing up in a communist country was really hard at some point in my education because when I started realizing the things um, that we were missing, like the speech of freedom, like I couldn't talk about what I think that was right or wrong. Um, in the system, so that was really hard at some point. I think one of the best things was having my family and friends with me growing up. We are people that we are really happy. Um, we like to be together. We like to have like friendships with people. My first year um, living here without my family, even though I have my husband with me, it wasn't the same. We saw an opportunity because there was a need in the community to advertise to the Hispanic population here in California. Ti Primera Mano means first hand in English, and we thought about giving um, our community the news or the message um, first hand to them. And it was also an opportunity for me to express our culture because our magazine is in Spanish, and that's one of the best ways to keep our culture here in the United States is speaking our language and keeping the tradition for other generations to come. As a Mexican-American, Eddie Sotelo is trying to embrace part of his culture, even if it means putting himself on blast for having trouble keeping up with Spanish lyrics. I do speak Spanish. I just don't speak it well. <laughs> As Latinos, Eddie and his uncle, Edgar, felt like it was important to serve their communities. Here we Go. The pair hosts the Showboy Show, airing on radio stations across the country and serving a growing population of bilingual Hispanics. Edgar says the show is like a family house party. In those house parties in Latin culture, you'll see that as Latinos, sometimes some conversations will be happening in English, others in Spanish. It's reality in many Hispanic households, being raised by Spanish-speaking parents, but not speaking the language fluently. Man, it is a blessing Come on, best. to be bicultural, tricultural. That's the case for Eddie, and he's making it known all while poking fun at his situation. The listeners were were clowning on me or hate were hating on me saying like I can't believe this kid is you know labeling himself as a Mexican but he doesn't know how to speak Spanish uh, he's a no sabo he's a pocho he has a he has a nopal on his face which means I look Hispanic but don't know how to speak Spanish humor has been a way for Eddie to embrace his bicultural identity and normalize not speaking fluent Spanish this conversation can be embarrassing difficult and even painful for some this makes me teary as well. I just, um, I adored my grandmother and we had very superficial conversations and I never got to have one of those real deep conversations with her. And I, I missed that, you know, I missed that window. My grandmother was 15, she was 14 when they got married. Micaela Moro's grandparents came from Mexico, but her dad was raised in Anaheim, an area that has a dark history with Spanish. By 1921, 26 states, including California, had banned teaching Spanish in schools as part of a growing anti-Mexican sentiment that peaked in the 1930s with the repatriation of thousands of Mexican Americans. The LA area was especially affected 
affected. He was actually beat by teachers for speaking English when nobody in his home spoke English. He didn't know it when he started kindergarten. And he faced issues around town, you know, he, my father was very dark skinned and, and he was not allowed to do some things that lighter skinned people are able to do. Because of this, Moro says her family lost their native language because of assimilation. Well, it just makes me really um, sad. Like so many in her shoes, Moro is now reclaiming her history with the goal of being a fluent Spanish speaker, embracing her heritage. She signed up for a class at Casa de Español. And I just know, you know, my family is very proud. I will be able to continue to make them proud and I look forward to the day where I can just hold a conversation and not have to think about what I'm saying anymore. This resonates for Chris Martinez. It's something that's kind of like sad, but also at the same time uh, makes you feel like you're not alone. Um, and yeah, yeah, sorry, it kind of makes me a little... Um... Raised in Arkansas, Martina says his parents didn't find a need to teach him Spanish. As a kid, he quickly realized he looked different than his peers. I was very aware of the fact that I was, you know, Hispanic and like not, you know, like white like everyone else and everything. And so it was a little tougher for me. In 2020, he began reflecting more on his identity. There was a big shift in America as far as like race and everything goes and I started to realize that like a lot of my personality was based off of just like pushing down feelings of like you know being proud of like my culture just for the sake of fitting in. Last year Martinez moved to Sacramento and decided to take action to reclaim his heritage. He started taking classes at Casa de Español. I'm still struggling with to get through that kind of almost imposter syndrome of like you know, getting in touch with like who I am. And yeah, but I'd say now I feel more empowered to do so. And I do feel more connected to, you know, the community, the culture and everything that comes with that. It's a goal Maria Harrington has been helping people reach since 2011 as the owner and director of Casa de Español. It's really important that they get the full immersive experience because when they go out into the world, they're not going to be able to have me there translating everything for them. Aquí en la escuela. This is Harrington's basic Spanish class. About 25% of our students are trying to reconnect with their heritage in some way. Like Martinez and Moro, Harrington says she's here to help her students rediscover their cultures. It's something she says she's had to do at one point in her life. When um, I started kindergarten, um, one of my principals told me that if I continued to speak Spanish, that I would never be a true American. And so I stopped speaking Spanish for many years. Like many, Harrington found herself not being able to identify as an American or with her native heritage. You're not only shamed uh, being like multicultural, you're not only shamed by one side because you do speak it or because you like certain things from your heritage, but then you're shamed from because your your heritage doesn't see you as being enough because you're from the United States. Because it can be an emotional process for her students, Harrington says she has a specific approach to teaching. You're here to learn, we're all here to learn. There's no pressure, there's no panic, and you're gonna be you're gonna um, be successful. And everyone here is gonna be successful. Students start off with an A plus 4.0. Through this rediscovery process, we've seen it cause pain and also joy. But what's clear is it's opening the door for a new experience and cultural conversation. You can't make the experience disappear, but hopefully by seeing that it's changing and the future looks positive, um, that it's a way for us to heal. And I think that that's happening. Despite the racist past, humor will always be a part of how some reconnect with their roots. You don't feel ashamed. Have fun, you know, and just keep on practicing your Spanish. And if you mess up, it's okay. Mi nombre es Mario González. Soy de Patagonia, Argentina. Y vivo en Sacramento. Vivir en contacto con la naturaleza y los animales es uno de los recuerdos más lindos que tengo de mi niña. Siempre quise conocer algo más de, de Argentina y conocer una ciudad grande como era Buenos Aires, con lo cual mi papá me dio la oportunidad de poder eh, comenzar mis estudios en la primer universidad de periodismo que hubo en Latinoamérica, que fue la Universidad de La Plata. Una vez recibido allí, Comencé a trabajar como asesor en prensa durante dos periodos. Haber trabajado en política y con políticos durante tantos años eh, no era algo que fuera 
automáticamente eh, aceptado mi sexualidad como ser persona gay. Todo el mundo sabía de que él era mi pareja. Entonces, la aceptación creo que eh, no la esperamos recibir, sino que la buscamos. Siempre se habla de los argentinos en general como si son unas personas que pueden llegar a ser arrogantes o creerse como que son mejores que el resto del mundo. Um, y en realidad la visión creo que está un poco sesgada. Nos gusta mencionar todas las virtudes que tiene nuestro país. Estoy orgulloso de ser argentino por formar parte de una comunidad que es solidaria y que básicamente eh, siempre trata de sobreponerse a las adversidades. Hola, me llamo Víctor Hugo, soy de Lima, la capital del país de Perú. Perú queda en Sudamérica. Eh, mi experiencia en Lima, la capital de Perú, en mi adolescencia fue muy entretenida, divertida. Vivo en la costa del Perú, a 10 minutos de la playa, en un ambiente tropical. Siempre estuve rodeado de amigos, jugando a la pelota, haciendo música, que es lo que más me divierte y sobre todo ser calmar. Mi pasión por la música verdaderamente empezó en la época del colegio. Recuerdo que mi primer instrumento musical que toqué fue la zampoña, que es un instrumento musical andino que sirve como flauta. Para nosotros cholo en Perú significa gente del campo, la gente campesina, la gente que trabaja en la tierra, la gente de la montaña. El campesino eh, se le dice cholo, indígena. Yo por parte de mi familia vengo de la familia afroperuana, somos de... Y para mí estoy muy orgulloso de, como afroperuano, decir que la gente del campo, los indígenas, es bonito. Colorful paint jobs with glimmering specks of metallics. Bouncing hydraulics cruising low and slow. This is lowrider and Chicano culture. I've been lowriding since I was a kid. I bought this car for my wife. So my wife likes, she likes jewelry and bling. So that's why the gold and the chrome engraving. This 1965 Chevy Impala is a labor of love for Chito Morales. And for many lowrider owners, fixing and making additions to the car is a never ending process. Every lowrider you see out there, they're all different. It's just the way we express ourselves from our paint jobs to our wheels, to the engraving on the cars, the interiors. Tinkering with classic cars has been a lifelong passion for Morelis. My dad's had low riders his whole life. Um, he's cruised San Jose back in the 70s with my uncles. Um, he's always worked on classic cars. Since the 1980s, State Vehicle Code has allowed cities across California to stop drivers from cruising and driving cars modified to be a certain height. Cities like Sacramento, Modesto, and San Jose have recently lifted the decades-old ban. I, I was happy they lifted the ban because um, lifting the ban, it just unifies everybody. Low riders, hot rods, I mean, C10 trucks. Everybody, it just unifies everybody to go out there, cruise, enjoy it. And speaking of C10 trucks. I have my truck behind me, but I also have a 58 Impala that my husband built for me. And it was in my brother's memory because he had a black one. Tina Perez Tateo credits her late brother for introducing her to low riders. That's how I feel here in, in my gut of my brother and my husband building me a car like his to take that burden off my shoulders because I wanted to do something for him in his memory. Aside from dedicating her car after her brother, Perez Tateo felt drawn to make some changes in her Modesto community. She's part of Cruising Culture of Modesto, a group that fought to legalize cruising and succeeded this past July. And we had to prove to them that it could work. But we got really lucky because a lot of people on the city council are car people. Cruising across the state could soon be possible. Assembly Bill 436 will remove the ban statewide. For both Perez Tateo and Mireles, the concern for banning it in the first place should no longer be an issue today. It's a whole different time now. You know, times have changed, people's grow people have grown up. 
The roots of low riding can be traced back to the 1940s when car culture was taking off after World War II when veterans were purchasing cars with the money earned from their service. That's our culture, you know, it goes, it goes back to when the, the GIs came back from World War II. By the 1970s, lowriders took a more formalized political function with the Chicano movement and the fight for equality. In the 1980s, cruising was associated with gang culture, creating a stigma for everyone who was into lowriders and cruising. Now, Perez Tateo says things have changed for the better. We're different people now. We're 30 years older now. We have children. We have grandchildren. You know, and we want them to cruise with us. Perez Tateo says her love for lowriders came from her dad a war veteran. She says it gave him something to look forward to after coming home from World War II. They came back and they thought of, hey, I want to do this car like this and I'm going to put sandbags in the in the trunk to lower it because none of this hydraulic stuff was we had back then, right? Perez Tatea also hopes to help remove the stigma that this car culture is only for Hispanic men. They want to move from the passenger side to the driver's side now and to be a role model for the younger generation. Assemblymember David Alvarez introduced AB 436. Low riding and cruising is part of, of culture. It's part of a lot of our communities throughout the state, and it shouldn't be something that gets penalized. The local government also needs to have the ability to m make sure that people are safe. And when we had problems, we had to stop the cruising. I think we should. So I respectfully ask for a no vote. Most cruising events now happen during the day. Lifting the ban would allow more people to come together to reclaim their identity and culture and address some of the safety concerns. It just brings unity, not just in our community, but amongst the state. But to also inspire a new wave of car enthusiasts. I hope they pick up a trade, doing mechanics, painting, uh, upholstery, bodywork. It's out there for them to do, you know, so we hope to keep that alive also. <laughs> Hola mi gente, I'm Carlos Candia, I'm from Colombia, and a Colombian singer based in the beautiful city of Sacramento. My love for music and theater was from the beginning, like my, my dad and my mom, they, they are these kind of people that they listen to music all the time. My brothers, they started on the symphonic band, and I was, you know, like they take me to watch my brothers. I told my dad, like, I want to do this, I want to be with them, the Colombian flavor that we, we, we born with that, literally. It gave me a tool to transmit this to the people in Sacramento and to the people of the, the, the Californian people. So it's crazy because there is a lot of, you know, Mexican music and mariachi and banda, but there is something particular with the Colombian culture and the rhythm. So being a Colombian, um, is, it's living with this stigma about Pablo Escobar, about drugs. Colombia is, it's James Rodriguez, Shakira, eh, Juanes. We have Gabriel Garcia Marquez, that is one of the biggest eh, writers in the world. So, and we have a lot of stuff to offer. It has many names. Oh, soccer? Football. I call it footy. Soccer, football, footy, whatever you want to call it, is a world game. And meanings. It's just an escape. My therapy. Life. For me, soccer, soccer is my like everything. everything. Went to Irvington High School in Fremont. Played soccer at Fresno State. 28 goals. Drafted to the LA Galaxy. Nine years in, in Puerto Rico. Captain of the, the Puerto Rico Islanders. Also captain of the Puerto Rico national team through two World Cup qualifying campaigns. Rarely on the sideline as a player, now it's where Noah Delgado spends every practice and game in his first year as Oakland Roots head coach. I was in their shoes, you know, in like literally in their shoes. Delgado has deep roots in Northern California and is making it his mission to give back to the new generations of soccer players. You know, soccer has been, it's not always easy. You know, you get traded, do they cut, um, and then you look to what you can do, but I think my experience with that, I can definitely help these guys and show them directions and, and give them guidance. It's something his mom, Jenna, saw in him from an early age. The patience to teach him, he's just been with soccer since he's been two years old. His first mentee, his younger brother, Eli. I mean, knowing my whole life was a great mentor growing up. The two-year age difference? 
made them teammates for life. It's a dream to be able to play with your brother, you know, growing up and then going to Puerto Rico to, you know, sign a contract and he was there right with me. So, I mean, I couldn't ask for more in a brother. The Oakland Roots began in 2018 and started signing players in 2019, including young Latinos from Northern California. Those efforts continue today with Project 510, targeting locals with hopes of becoming professionals. I am pretty sure there's someone in the crowd tonight that one day will possibly be with the first team Oakland Roots. That dream became a reality for 18-year-old Kieran Beckinsara from Berkeley at the rivalry game against Sacramento Republic, signing his first professional contract and his first game on the bench with the Oakland Roots. A player like me, maybe if there wasn't a Project 510, I wouldn't have any opportunities, tryouts, or coaches looking at me from a professional team. Beckinsara says he's looking forward to the opportunity for more coaching from Delgado. I like his coaching because um, he brings confidence to me. Like we're never negative, always positive, always in a good mood. Roots captain Emra Clementa says he can see Delgado's guidance in the rookies on the field. Yes, he's, he's given those younger players a lot of confidence. He speaks to us from a place, from a player's perspective, you know, not so much as a coach. And I think a lot of guys buy into that. For Clementa, his relationship with Delgado is not only coach and player, good work, Emra. but former team captain to a current one. Being a leader, you know, he's always telling me, you know, be the voice, be, be the guy that, you know, integrates that energy. And so uh, he's just been very positive. Delgado has always been a coach. Even as a player, he trained youth teams. Head up, head up, head up, head up. Along with his second assistant coach, Danilo Jean. The two use Project 510 to give kids opportunities they never had growing up. You know, if you wanted to play professionally, you had to go somewhere else. You had to leave somewhere. You had to go to another country. Um, but now, you know, thankfully now with, with Roots and having Project 510, you have this direct link. Born in Mexico, Danilo moved with his parents to the States when he was nine. Growing up in Alameda, he played at Cal State East Bay, where the Roots now host their games, a full circle moment. To help my local community and the kids, you know, immigrant kids, which I was an immigrant kid also, um, is my dream come true. Today, Danilo defines wins not by goals, but by helping local kids get their shot. You know, when I, when I saw Edsker make his debut, it was one of the, you know, the proudest moments of my coaching career, now winning titles. Edsker Cruz and Danny Gomez, two local kids, now pros thanks to Project 510. My name is Edsker Cruz, and I'm from Modesto, California. Edsker made his professional debut yeah, before legally becoming an adult. Dale, Edsker, dale, Edsker. And fellow rookie midfielder Daniel Gomez became the first player from Project 510 to make it onto a USL Championship 1 team. I'm 23 years old, and I went to college at California State University Stanislaus in Turlock, and I'm from Antica. For Cruz, Gomez, and Coach Delgado, their connection deeper than representing the same team, but sharing a similar culture, all introduced to the game they love by their fathers. Every Hispanic dad would be watching the game. If you go to any Hispanic house, there's always soccer. For Danny Gomez, the game is a connection to his family roots being first generation. My dad grew up in Mexico. He was born in Mexico, so over there, it's all soccer. He kind of took that culture, brought it over to me, kind of introduced it to me. Passing down tradition, lessons, connecting places and people. Showing me the game at an early age, uh, me playing with my friends growing up. So it's just like culture being like brought down generations. So while Noah Delgado may no longer be on the field, a true athlete knows a legacy can live on in players that come after you. Show them what this beautiful game could give. It's given me everything. And now these young players are, we're helping them, giving them a, a platform to play. 